Hi guys, so Jason Matthew here and today we're going to be doing enzymes and we're going to be doing part two of the enzyme podcast. So yes, that means that there is an enzymes part one and um, you can get that full podcast on the Biochem GM channel on YouTube. So please go look at it if you haven't as yet because you really should look at part one to understand part two. Now, just to give you a little glimpse of what we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at the lock and key hypothesis, we're going to be looking at the induced fit hypothesis, as well as we're going to be looking at how substrate binds to the enzyme. So, let's just get started, people. Alright, so first of all, let's just recap what we did in enzymes part one. So, we defined what an enzyme is, uh, we stated how important enzymes are. We looked at an energy profile diagram of an enzyme catalyzed reaction and by doing that we define what activation energy is we also looked at how to name enzymes um, from the common names to the systematic names and we also looked at the six major enzyme classes we were able to define what a hollow enzyme is and what an apo enzyme is and what a cofactor is and the difference between a co-substrate and a prosthetic group and finally in the enzymes part one we compared inorganic catalysts to enzymes and we saw that enzymes hands down were more efficient catalysts than the inorganic catalysts so if any of this sounds unfamiliar to you i would strongly recommend that you go back to enzymes part one on the youtube channel and go through it um, before you go to do this part two because in one goes into the other so what are we doing today well there were three characteristics of enzymes three hallmark features of enzymes the first one is that they have a, a, a tremendous catalytic power and we looked at that in enzymes part one today we're going to be looking at the second hallmark characteristic of enzymes which are enzymes are specific the third hallmark um, characteristic is that enzymes are can be regulated but we're not going to be looking at the regulation of enzymes today today we're really going to be focusing on the specificity of enzymes uh, we're also going to be looking at the Fisher's lock and key hypothesis the Koshland's induced fit hypothesis as well as we're going to be looking at the effect of substrate concentration, enzyme concentration, temperature, as well as pH on the velocity, or in other words, the rate of the enzyme catalyzed reaction. And finally, we're going to take a brief look at the clinical applications of certain enzymes. So something to always remember, at the end of the day, most proteins sorry most enzymes in fact all the enzymes that we're going to be discussing in this course are proteins if you go back to enzymes part one you will see that there are enzymes that are not proteins but the most common enzymes are proteins and the reason why i'm making this point is that for you to fully understand how enzymes work you need to to have your protein chemistry down so if you think that you are a little rusty in your proteins, I strongly recommend that you go to your textbooks, you go to your notes, and you revise proteins. The good news is that also on my Biochem GM YouTube channel, there are podcasts on proteins. And I would strongly recommend that you focus on the different levels of structure of protein going from what is the primary structure, what is the secondary structure, and what is the tertiary as well as the quaternary structure. This will come in handy for um, what you're doing in enzyme. Also, when you did proteins, you would have seen that proteins can be denatured. You should also revise that as well. And the tertiary structure of a protein and the types of bonding that keeps the tertiary structure in place. All that is very important to understand if you're doing enzymes. So please, if you think your protein kung fu is a little rusty, go back and practice some more 
on your proteins and then continue with this lecture. So enzymes are specific and if you look lower down you will see that I have put a block here that blocks out a certain word and that's how we're going to be studying this topic throughout this podcast. I will be quizzing you all along the way to make sure you are understanding what's going on. So let's read. A given enzyme is very selective. Substances with which it interacts and in the reaction that it catalyzes. The substances upon which an enzyme acts are traditionally called. So I want you to tell me what these substances, what, what is the name that we give generally to these substances? Now, if you remember from your chemistry, you would know that substances that react together, we call them reactants. Well, in enzymology, we give a special name for those reactants. So, do you know what it is? So, if you said substrates, you are correct. And we can move on. Now, in an enzyme catalyzed reaction, because enzymes are so specific for the type of substrate that they react with as well as the type of reaction they do what you see happening with enzyme catalyzed reactions is that there are no non-productive side reactions as well as there's no wasteful byproducts and that is very significant because anybody who have worked in a organic chemistry lab and you did natural products probably as a course you know that your yield in organic chemistry laboratories is sometimes maybe as low as 30 percent 50 percent and these are acceptable yields when you're doing an organic chemistry all right but with enzyme because they are so specific you don't get these side reactions you always get the same product all the time now let's continue the selective qualities of an enzyme are collectively recognized as its what do you think is the best word to finish off that sentence so you should have said specificity all right intimate interaction between an enzyme and its substrates occurs through molecular recognition based on so in other words what it's saying here is that the substrate has to bind to the enzyme and how does it do that? Maybe you, you have come across it before in another course. How does a substrate all right, bind to the enzyme? You're saying that it's true molecular recognition. What do you mean by molecular recognition? What does that exactly mean? Well, it's based on the structural complementarity. In other words, the substrate has a complementary shape to the enzyme. All right. And finally, the specific site on the enzyme where substrate binds and catalysis occurs is called the, in other words, the enzyme is a protein and it's a big molecule. But does the substrate bind to the whole enzyme? Well, the answer is no. The substrate does not bind to the whole enzyme. All right. The substrate binds to a specific part in the enzyme. So all the action, all the catalysis taking place at a specific site on the enzyme. It's not the whole enzyme involved. It's a specific site on the enzyme where all this action is taking place. And we correctly call it the active site. So I hope I haven't lost you all so far. If you think that, that you are getting a little um, overwhelmed, always we, we made that pause button just for situations like this. Press the pause button, go back, revise, as well as while doing this lecture, please have your pen and your paper next to your laptop or whatever and keep writing notes. I will always tell all my students that the more you write, the better you will remember. Do things in your own handwriting, draw diagrams, because at the end of the day, when you go in the exam room, you can't press print, you can't press copy and paste. You have to write, so learn to write. All right, so we just established that it's the active site where all this catalysis, where all this action is taking place on the enzyme. So we have given it a name. Now let's go into what an active site is now. Well, the active site of an enzyme is generally a pocket or 
So again, if you have read about enzymes in the textbooks, you have seen this um, description all the time. So either they describe the active cell as a pocket or it's, a, and I'll give you a hint, it starts with the letter C. So what do you think it is? All right. So I'm hoping that you correctly said cleft. So let's read that sentence now. The active site of an enzyme is generally a pocket or cleft that is specialized to recognize specific substrates and catalyze chemical transformation. It is formed in a 3D structure, in other words, a three-dimensional structure by a collection of different amino acids. So when throughout this lecture, when you see this abbreviation AA, know that it stands for amino acids. So let's read over that sentence. It is formed in a 3D structure by a collection of different amino acid residues that may or may not be adjacent in the primary sequence or the prime, I should say the primary structure. All right. The interactions between the active site and the substrate occur via the same forces that stabilize the protein tissue structure. So again, that's why I said you need to know your proteins. So if I ask you, what are the forces that keep the, the tertiary structure stable? All right, what forms the tertiary structure? So if you know the answer that, you know the answer to, to the type of forces between the active site and the substrate. All right, so you should see the hydrophobic interactions electrostatic interactions, hydrogen bonding, and van der Waal forces. Now, what I should point out is that all these forces of attraction are weak forces of attraction. And you want that. You don't want the substrate to be permanently bound to the enzyme. Eh? So if you can see here, you see that these are all weak forces of attraction. And therefore, you might, you might have said um, covalent bonding but that will be wrong for this there's no covalent bonding between the substrate and the active site covalent bonding is a strong bond as i just said it is weak forces of attraction being formed between the substrate and the active site so they will never have any covalent bonds being formed between the substrate and the active site be very careful about that all right enzyme active sites do not simply bind substrates so maybe at the lower O level, you may have learned that, you know, the substrate is binds to the active site. No, it's a lot more complex than that. The active site also provide catalytic groups to facilitate the chemistry and provide specific interactions that stabilize the formation of the transition state for the chemical reaction. Now this term transition state shouldn't be new to you. You should know the term transition state. If you don't, then that means you need to go back to enzymes part one and look at what a, transi what a transition state is. All right. Now, let's go back to this point here. We are saying that the active site just doesn't simply bind to the substrate. The active site will also contain catalytic groups. And these catalytic groups will be the R groups of the amino acid residues present in the active site. Now that's all I want you all to know for now. When we do enzyme mechanisms in another in a higher level course, because this is just level one, when you do it from level two onwards, when you look at enzyme mechanisms, then you will go into the details of what these catalytic groups can be in the active site. Like for instance, there's acid-base catalysis, and you will see that you will need to have acid and basic groups in the active site for the reaction to speed up all right but all i want you to know is that there are catalytic groups that provide specific interaction that stabilize the formation of the transition state that's all i want you to know for now so we made a point in the previous slide we said that the active site is formed in a three-dimensional structure by a collection of different amino acid residues that may or may not be adjacent in the primary sequence. So let's discuss that a little bit. I want to make sure that you all understand what we are saying by that. So I'm hoping that my penmanship will be okay for you all. 
So let's see this. And let's put some amino acid residues. And we're going to use a very high tech naming mechanism here. We're going to call this amino acid residue A, then B, C, D, E, F, G, H. All that's showing I, and of course, that's showing J for JSON. All right, so we have all these amino acids. Now, in the, in the primary structure, in other words, the linear sequence, A is next to B, but amino acid residue H, I, and J are very far from A. All right, but what we're saying is that when the active site is formed, all right, the active site is not a linear sequence. It's a three-dimensional shape, and it, it involves the folding of the protein, which is the enzyme. So it could very well mean that when this protein folds, and I'm just going to use an arbitrary thing here. Now you say the protein starts to fold there. Then amino acid A, which was at the beginning, is now close to, let's say, H. All right? And amino acid B is now close to, um, I would say, uh, G, right? But you understand what I mean? Because of the folding amino acid residues that were far away in the linear sequence are now close together, all right? So that's what happens in um, when the active site is formed. So the any the primary structure, they might be far apart, but when they start to fold in the tertiary structure, these amino acids come closer together. And that's an important concept that I want you all to understand. All right, so this here, this diagram here is that it's saying here, an, en an enzyme substrate complex, and I don't think I have mentioned that too much, so let's see. When the substrate will bind to the active site of the enzyme, what we are saying is that when the substrate binds to the active site of the enzyme, an enzyme substrate complex is formed. Now, if you watch the two here, this is the active site of the enzyme, and this is your substrate, and this substrate is going to bind to the active site. Now, if you look at the shape of the active site, it has a complementary shape to the shape of the substrate, and you could visually see the substrate is going to fit nicely into the active site. It's like two pieces of a puzzle, right? It's, they fit together nicely. Now, what we are saying is that there are also the R groups of the amino acid residues in the active site is going to interact with the substrate. And what you're seeing here, they just give you some certain chemical groups. They said a, a hydrophobic uh, group, an amino group, a negative charge, another hydrophobic group, and an oxygen, all right? Uh, what we're saying is that these groups here is what are represented here, 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 here. So these groups on this side here are the chemical groups on the substrate. Uh, what we are saying is that the enzyme, the active side of the enzyme, also has chemical groups that are going to interact with these groups. So, so the hydrophobic group on the substrate is going to interact with a hydrophobic group on the active side. This amino group on the substrate is going to interact with the oxygen on the enzyme active site to form a hydrogen bond. The negative charge on the substrate is going to interact with a positive charge on the active site. All right? And so on. So there's interactions there. All right? And these weak forces of attraction will bind the substrate to the enzyme. But it's not a permanent bond because it's not a strong covalent bond, for instance. Right? It's weak bonds. It's is um, hydrogen bonding, it's electrostatic force of attraction, hydrophobic interactions, and so on. And that will keep the substrate there in the active site until it forms a product. Now, there are different hypotheses and models that propose to explain enzyme specificity and catalysis. You have the Fisher's lock and key hypothesis, you have the Koshland's induced fit hypothesis. The non-productive binding model um, involves or suggests that while good substrates bind in only one correct way, bad substrates usually bind to the enzyme incorrectly and cannot react. Then there's strain and distortion, 
where the binding of the substrate results in a distortion of the substrate which can be either pulling or pushing of the bond and in that way that makes the chemical reaction easier and finally transition state stabilization and what we're saying here is that enzymes recognize and stabilize atomic features that are present in the transition state and again i will urge you all to go and look in enzymes part one and see what the transition state is all right i'll just give you a brief rundown remember as you go from substrate to product bonds are being broken in the substrate and bonds are being formed in the product now there's a point there where the, at the highest energy level where bonds are being broken bonds are being formed we call that the transition state and what we are saying is that the enzyme will recognize and stabilize the transition state all right so the transition state is a very important um, thing for the enzyme to recognize and to speed up the reaction and in fact we actually because we know that we have developed certain drugs all right that take advantage of that piece of knowledge that we know where the enzymes will target the transition state and there's something called transition state analogs that we use in medicine also in agriculture as well in pesticides and so on so you could do a little extra but it's outside the scope of this course but you could do some extra reading and do a, and do a little read up about transition state analogs it's going to enhance what you're doing now all right i will do it in a in a level two course now why we have all these different theories we are going to focus today on the fisher's lock and key hypothesis and the Koshland's induced fit hypothesis so the lock and key hypothesis and as the name gives it away i guess there's a lock and a key involved now on the left hand side here we're looking at the lock all right sorry the key <laughs> what's wrong with me this is the key here and this is the lock and as you can see the lock sorry the lock here if you look at the shape of the lock it has a complementary shape to the shape of the key and if the, if you you could visually see that the key is going to fit exactly have a nice snug fit into the active site so this key is specific to this lock all right so again let me just recap i think i just mixed up i just said it would actually which is uh, i'm going way ahead of myself so let's start back this is the key and what we are saying the key has a specific complementary shape that fits into this lock all right so it fits nice and snug in other words if that's why we have locks all right is that only a certain key will open that lock so for instance my key will open my front door right but i can't go to your home and open your front door with my key well at least i hope not because then that would be kind of strange all right so it shouldn't happen but the, the point here is is that you have a specific key for a specific lock and it all depends on the shape of that key is complementary to the shape of the lock and that is the same uh, and we use that analogy for what's happening with the between the enzyme active site and the substrate so here now we have the substrate and we have the active site of the enzyme and if you look at the shape of the substrate it is complementary to the shape of the active site and this substrate is going to fit nice and snug into the active site now if i for instance i don't know let us i'm going to attempt to draw something but let's say you had another substrate now that looks something like this now that does not have a complementary shape to this active site in other words this substrate based on its shape cannot fit in this active site and that's how we say that um that that enzymes are specific and it's based on their shape so just like how the key had a specific shape for its lock we have the same thing happening in the lock and key hypothesis between the substrate and the active site so the substrate will be analogous to what the key was and the active site will be analogous to the lock 
So lock will be at the side key substrate. All right. Now remember, eh, I hope you understand this. If you didn't get something that I said, rewind and go it over again because I'm going to be asking you questions later on. So please make sure you understand what I said about the lock and key hypothesis. All right. So here's another diagram for it. So as I said, the substrate molecules, they have a complementary shape to the active site. And the substrate molecules is going to bind to the active site of the enzyme. When the substrate molecules bind to the active site of the enzyme, they form what is called an enzyme substrate complex. Now, when it forms the enzyme substrate complex, the substrate molecules is going to be converted to product. Um, and what we're saying is that the product, once, once it is formed, the shape of the product is different from the shape of the substrate. In other words, while the substrate fit nice and snug into the active site, the product does not fit into the active site, so it is released. And, and the active site uh, becomes available once again for substrate to bind to it. All right, so you see here the above diagram illustrates the lock and key hypothesis. The approaching substrate fits perfectly into the enzyme, so that will be the two substrates that fit into the active side there. All right, and they say like a key going into a lock, so the substrate will be the lock. The active si sorry, what I'm saying, the substrate is the key, sorry, and the active side here will be the lock. The enzyme substrate complex is then formed. So when the substrate binds to the active side of the enzyme, we say an enzyme substrate complex is formed. Now, once the substrate is converted to products, the products no longer fit the lock of the act, or in other words, the active site, and therefore they are released. So once product is formed, it doesn't fit no longer into the active site. It is released. Therefore, the active site of this enzyme is now available for more substrate molecules to come and bind to it. And that will continue until all the substrate is finished. So let's see if you got all of that. If you think you're not ready as yet, that's fine. Go back, revise it, all right? Make some more notes, and then come to this slide and see if you can tackle it, eh? So let's jump into this because this is a this is a nice revision as well. So let's see. Lock and key hypothesis. The fit between the substrate and the active site of the enzyme is how you think you'll best end this sentence. So one word you could possibly use is exact. You mightn't use that word, you might have used something that means exact, that's fine. Alright, so again, the fit between the substrate and the active site of the enzyme is exact. Just like our key fits into our lock very precisely. Now, what they're saying there now is which one is the key and which one is the lock. So the key is the substrate, right? And the enzyme's active site is what we refer to as the lock. So I hope you got that. And I think you did. So, so good job, guys. So far, so good. Now, when the substrate binds to the active site, of the enzyme a temporary structure is formed now what do we call that temporary structure people and i know you know this one and you would have said enzyme substrate complex so good job guys i'm proud of you all let's continue products now on the other hand they don't stay in the active site and why is that it is the reason for that is that the products have a different you got it shape from the substrate so excellent job guys you got all correct we can move on so the last thing we're going to read now is this last point here. Once formed, that is the products we're talking about. So once the products are formed, they are released from the active site, leaving it free. In other words, leaving the active site free now to become attached to another substrate. So what we are saying is that once the product is formed, the product leaves the active site because it has a different shape than the substrate. And when that happens, the active site is now available once again for more substrate molecules to bind to it and that process will keep on continuing until all the substrate has been converted to products now the good thing about the lock and key hypothesis is that it explains enzyme specificity so it, it, it explains why enzymes will only react with a certain substrate and why it will only give a certain type of reaction all right. It also explains why um, the enzyme loses activity when it's denatured. 
Now, again, that's why I said you need to know your protein chemistry. So what does what do we mean by denature? Because remember, enzymes are proteins, eh? When we say enzymes are denature, we mean that the enzyme, unlike any other protein, it loses its tertiary structure, meaning that the enzyme unfolds and the three-dimensional shape is lost. All right, and I know where you, you should be thinking ahead now. Remember, where on the enzyme does the catalysis take place? And you should have correctly said it's the active site. Now, the active site is dependent on its three dimensional shape. Remember, for the substrate to bind to the active site, it must have that complementary fit. And the only way it could have that is if the enzyme has its three dimensional shape. Now, when the enzyme is denatured, it unfolds. Therefore, the active site loses that shape. So the substrate cannot bind to the active site anymore. So there's no reaction. So we say that the enzyme loses activity. So the lock and key hypothesis was able to explain those two things. And we were happy about that for a while at least. But then as we learned more about enzymes and we study their mechanisms and we study exactly how our substrate binds to an active site, we realize that the lock and key hypothesis was too rigid a hypothesis and that they were saying that the active site had a certain shape and it never changed and that was too rigid for based on what we were seeing in terms of the mechanisms and how the substrate bind so that led to the another hypothesis which we call the induced fit hypothesis and the good news about this is that sometimes in biochemistry we get a break where the name tells you all and this is one of the situations we are saying it's the induced fit hypothesis meaning that the fit between the substrate and the active site is induced now let's look at the diagram the diagram tells you everything here you have the substrate and you have the active site now unlike the lock and key hypothesis lock and key hypothesis will say that the active site will be perfectly complementary to the substrate but if you look here it's not perfect um it's not as it's not com totally complementary to the substrate but what happens as the substrate comes closer to the active site all right as the substrate enters the enzyme and it comes closer to the active site it induces a slight change in shape of the enzyme and the active site now becomes totally complementary all right so we're saying that the substrate induces a slight change in shape in the enzyme's active site so that the substrate binds perfectly to the active site to become the enzyme substrate complex and as and just like with the with the lock and key hypothesis once that is once the enzyme substrate complex is formed then the substrate is converted to products and the products will have a different shape than the substrate so they 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 are released from the enzyme so you see here enzymes are highly flexible just like a lot of proteins yeah? because they are proteins they are highly flexible conformationally dynamic i remember the, this big word conformation conformationally all it is is associated with is, is shape so when i tell you that something is conformationally dynamic all i mean is that it could change its shape all right and many of their remarkable properties including substrate binding and catalysis are due to their structural pliancy when a substrate combines with an enzyme it induces a change in the enzyme's conformation in other words it induces uh, a slight change in the enzyme shape the active site is then molded into a precise conformation making the chemical environment suitable for the reaction so this hypothesis is not as rigid as the lock and key hypothesis where in the lock and key hypothesis they were saying that the active site had a fixed shape what we've seen in the induced fit hypothesis is that yes it's complementary at, at the start but as the substrate comes closer to the active site as it enters the enzyme and goes closer to the active site the active site itself changes the shape slightly to even to fit for the substrate to fit into it better all right 
So look at the two models here. We have the lock and key hypothesis and we have the induced fit hypothesis. And if you compare it to you see here, if you look at the active side here for the lock and key hypothesis, it's an exact match, it's an exact complementary match to the substrate. So the substrate binds to the active site, forms the enzyme substrate complex. Now if you look at the induced fit model now, same substrate, but look at the active site. It it's not exactly complementary, but it still tells the substrate, well, hey, come bind with me. It still has that that pull to towards the substrate. And as soon as the substrate gets closer to it, its active site is going to change the shape slightly so it becomes perfectly complementary, like how it's up here. So the both of them have the same enzyme substrate complex. Eh? So now let's look at factors affecting reaction velocity. Now enzymes can be isolated from cells. All right? That's how we study enzyme kinetics. Eh? We isolate the enzymes from the cell. So we take the, in other words, we take the enzymes out of the living cell. All right? So we isolate, so it's just enzymes alone. And we can study their properties in a test tube. Now that kind of study where we're looking at the extract from a living material, we call those things what? So I hope you said in vitro studies. And if you if you um, are not familiar with the term, please go look it up and look at what in vivo studies are. All right. Now today what we're going to be looking at is that, well, again, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but you probably know this. But when you see these square brackets in science, these square brackets mean concentration. So if you see a S, capital S in square bracket, that's substrate concentration. Capital E in brackets, enzyme concentration. And we're also going to be looking at temperature and pH, how they affect the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. Right, so the first one we're going to be looking at is the effect of substrate concentration on reaction velocity. Now we have two curves here, all right? And we are plotting reaction velocity versus substrate concentration. Now, the one that we're going to be really focusing on in this podcast will be the one in blue. All right. That's the one that we're going to be focusing on. The other one, which represents allosteric enzymes, will be discussed more in a later podcast. Now, look at the blue line here, blue curve enzymes following michaelis menten kinetics all right now for michaelis menten kinetics the assumption that we're making is that the enzyme only has one active site so it means that for every enzyme molecule only one substrate is going to bind to that enzyme molecule because that enzyme molecule only has one active site where the substrate can bind and what we are saying is that for those enzymes that follows michaelis menten kinetics they will have a hyperbolic curve. And if you did biology, you would know that this hyperbolic curve is similar to the curve that is the oxygen dissociation curve of a certain molecule. And I'll give you a hint. It's a choice between myoglobin and hemoglobin. So which one you think gives the hyperbolic curve? So I'm hoping that you remember your biology and you would have said myoglobin. All right? So, but these are for enzymes that have only one active site. Now let's understand what's happening here. As substrate concentration is increasing, all right, you see that there is first an initial increase in the reaction rate. And that is expected because how you would explain that? Now if you remember from your chemistry and you look at reaction rates, is the same theory you're going to be applying to this enzyme catalyzed reaction is just like any other chemical catalyzed chemical reaction. Eh? What we are saying is that the more substrate you have, then it means that it's going to have an increased collision frequency. But don't just write increased collision frequency. You need to say, well, what are they colliding with? Well, the collision is taking place between the substrate molecules and the active side of the enzyme. So as you increase substrate concentration, there's more substrate molecules colliding with active sites per second. So that's this initial rise here that we're explaining. 
So we are saying that this initial rise is due to the increase in substrate molecules. There's an increase in collision frequency between substrate molecules and the active site per second. So the key thing is increased collision frequency. But as substrate concentration continues to increase, we see that it finally plateaus out and it goes to a maximum velocity, which we call Vmax. So in other words, as you increase substrate concentration, the rate of reaction does not increase indefinitely. There is a time where the um, it reaches a maximum velocity. Now, a point I should make in this experiment here is that um, we are keeping a few things constant. First of all, we are keeping the enzyme concentration constant. All right. We are also keeping temperature constant and we are also keeping pH constant. All right, so we are keeping these things constant. The only variable in this um, experiment is that we are increasing substrate concentration. All right, so if we have a fixed enzyme concentration, it means that we have a fixed amount of active sites available. And, and that explains this part of the curve, why it's plotting it out. It means that although we are adding more and more substrate molecules, it simply just doesn't have enough active sites present for these substrate molecules to, to, to come back to collide with. So it means that all you have like plenty more substrate molecules, there's no available active site. So they still have to wait until um, there's an active site available. So it means that the velocity could only go up to a maximum here. Now please note that we're not saying that the reaction stops. Eh? We are saying that the reaction is going on, but it's only at a maximum velocity. That you can increase the substrate concentration and how much more you want, the velocity is not, the reaction is not going to get faster. And the reason for that is because the enzyme active sites are fully saturated with substrate. And what we mean by that is that there's no free or available active site for any more substrate molecules to combine with. So there's a maximum velocity Vmax being established. Now with the allosteric enzymes, you see that they don't have a hyperbolic curve like the Michaelis menten kinetics enzyme that follow that. Allosteric enzymes have more a uh, sigmoidal curve. Now if you so that'll be the curve in green. Now if you remember, we said that enzymes following Michaelis menten curve, they have a hyperbolic curve, which was analogous to the oxygen dissociation curve of myoglobin. Now, for allosteric enzymes, they show a, a sigmoidal curve, and basically that's a fancy way of saying it's an S shape. So, if you're in a jam in the exam and you can't remember the word sigmoidal or you can't spell it, I will accept, I'll give you a bly if you put S shaped, all right? But you should already say sigmoidal, so I'll encourage that. Now, it means that if you're getting a different shape curve, Something should be telling the inner scientist and you should be shouting out at you right now and saying, well, here what? It means that this allosteric enzyme is different from the enzymes following Michaelis menten kinetics. And if you are thinking that, you are absolutely correct. The Michael, If you remember from when I started with this talk, I was saying that enzymes that follow Michaelis menten kinetics, they have only one active site. So what do you think happening with the allosteric enzymes? And you will probably guess it, the allosteric enzymes have more than one active site. So what I'm saying is that for every one allosteric enzyme molecule, they have more than one active site. Now you might have to say, well, how is that possible? Well, if you know anything about allosteric enzymes, you know that they have a quaternary structure. They are made up of more than one polypeptide chain. And each of these poly polypeptide chains will have at least one active site. So for every allosteric enzyme molecule, you have more than one active site being present. So we discussed a lot there, and I'm hoping that you got all of it. Now, if you didn't, that's okay. Press the go back, rewind, and go through it again. All right. Make sure you have a solid. Because these are popular enzyme questions. Um, yeah, exam questions where you look at the effect 
of substrate concentration the rate of reaction all right so if you think you're not ready as yet to go through these little blocks and figure them out no no worries it's just you on the computer right now go back rewind and try it again and then come back and see if you can handle this all right so maximal velocity and the maximum velocity is the rate of velocity of a reaction v is the number of so in other words we are asking you to define what velocity is so you should have said correctly that is the substrate molecules converted to product per unit time now some of you all might be saying hey i didn't say it like that i didn't say it was substrate molecules converted to product you may have also said that is the amount of product form per minute or per time i i actually put some units here micromole of product form per minute because a lot of times in my lab we would measure the velocity of an enzyme by measuring the amount of micromoles of product form per minute so what i'm saying is that you could either look at the amount of substrate being consumed or you can look at the amount of product being formed per unit time right and a lot of times we look at the amount of micromoles of product formed per minute all right now the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction increases with substrate concentration until a maximum velocity which we call Vmax is reached. The leveling of the reaction rate at high substrate concentration reflects the what do you think is the answer for that guy? So I'm hoping you said saturation. All right. In other words, the reason why the curve plateaus off and it goes to a Vmax is because all the active sites are saturated with substrate. There are no available free active sites for, for additional substrate to bind to. In other words, all the active sites, they are busy at the moment with substrate. Please wait your turn. There's no, although there are, there are a lot more substrate waiting, they have to continue to wait. They can, there's just no available active site right now. So we continue about we continue with substrate concentration hyperbolic shape of the enzyme kinetic curve so we say most enzymes show micros menten kinetics in which the plot of the initial reaction velocity v0 against substrate concentration is hyperbolic and that's similar in shape to the oxygen dissociation curve of which molecule i said it before it's correct myoglobin all right so myoglobin has a similar shape curve to what these Michaelis menten enzymes do. I remember why I told you about Michaelis menten enzymes, right? They have only one active site. Now that shape, that hyperbolic shape now is seen, a different shape curve is seen when you look at allosteric enzymes. And they frequently show a sigmoidal curve or S-shape curve. And that's similar in shape to the oxygen dissociation curve of correct hemoglobin all right and the reason why allosteric enzymes have that characteristic sigmoidal curve is because allosteric enzymes are made up of more than one polypeptide chain and therefore they have more than one active site so now we have enzyme concentration now the good news is is that um the graph for enzyme concentration the effect of enzyme concentration on the reaction rate is the same as the shape of the graph for substrate concentration. In other words, let's plot it here. All right. If we, oh God, a little excuse this, sir. Eh? You have V0 or initial velocity on the y-axis, and you have enzyme concentration. Basically, what you're going to get, you're going to get a straight line at first. All right. So you're going to get a straight line coming up like that, and then what you're going to see is that it's going to start a plateau off all right so you're going to get a constant velocity all right now you're making the assumption here that the substrate concentration all right the temperature as well as the ph is constant so you're making that assumption there all right now let's see what's happening so your, your, your substrate concentration 
your temperature and your pH is being constant. The only variable for this experiment is that you're increasing enzyme concentration. And we're going to also make the assumption that these are Michaelis menten enzymes, meaning that the enzymes only have one active site. So each enzyme molecule has only one active site. All right. So what we're saying is that at the beginning, all right, things are nice. As you increase enzyme concentration, you're going to increase the rate of reaction. That is expected. Because what's happening, all right, is that the substrate molecules, they're going to have, a, at the beginning, they're going to have a lot more substrate than enzyme molecules, all right? So, so in other words, all right, let's say that you had a thousand substrate molecules present mm -hmm. and in that first test tube you added let's just say um, 10 10 enzyme units and it was 10 enzyme molecules then it means that for one let's say these ends this the time it takes for a substrate molecule to bind to an active site all right is one second it means that in one second what is the maximum amount of substrate that could bind to these to these 10 enzyme molecules now remember we're making the assumption that one enzyme unit or one enzyme molecule has only one active site so if you have 10 enzymes it means that only 10 of these although you have a thousand substrate only 10 of them and that one second, only 10 substrate molecules combine to the 10 active sites are available. Although there's a thousand here, all right? So it means that the 990 substrate molecules that remain, they can't combine because there's just no available active site. Now, if I increase that now to 100 enzyme units, and you still remember substrate being kept constant, so in this test, you're going to be also adding a thousand substrate molecules. What's happening? It means now because you have a hundred active site available, a hundred in that one second, a hundred um, substrate molecules combined to these one hundred active sites on the enzymes. All right, so you see the rate went up by ten. So we're saying that right as you increase the enzyme concentration. All right you're going to increase the rate of the reaction. So the amount of substrate being converted to product per second, per one second here, is increasing. Now, if I increase, so again, keeping substrate, um, constant, all right? Now, now, let's say I increase it to 1,000 enzyme units. It means that we are happy now all the thousand substrate molecules could combine with the thousand active sites that will be available here so in one second a thousand substrate molecules will be will be converted to product all right but remember in this experiment the the substrate molecules is remaining the same the amount so let's say now we go back with the thousand again substrate molecules but this time we have Let's double it to 2,000 active sites. What's going to, how much substrate molecules could be converted per second here? It's going to still be a thousand because there's only the limiting factor now is that you have more active sites than you have substrate molecules. So the only only a thousand substrate molecules are present. So all you have 2,000 active sites. The rate is the same. The initial velocity is the same. That initial rate. Similarly, if I was to put 10,000 enzyme molecules, you still will get the 1,000 um, substrate molecules being converted per second. My point here is, is that at this point in time now, where you have more active sites available than substrate molecules, then the velocity will always be the same. All right. All right, now another thing that affects the rate of reaction is temperature. Now we have to be very, now this is a favorite question of mine, so please note the specifics. I'm very picky about specifics. The effect of temperature 
on an enzyme catalyzed reaction now essentially what you're doing when you are increasing temperature is that you are increasing the energy of the system and that does a few things now again this is overlapping with basic chemistry yeah? in, in any chemical reaction when you increase the temperature you're going to increase the rate of the reaction now you're increasing the rate of reaction because of two things happening you're increasing the rate of reaction as you increase temperature because you're increasing the collision frequency between the reactant molecules. In this case, for enzyme catalyzed reaction, you're increasing the frequency, the collision frequency between substrate and active site. So that's one way in which increasing temperature increases the rate of reaction. The other thing that is happening is that now I, I, I discuss a term called activation energy in enzymes 1 and you need to understand that term to understand what I'm about to say. What we say is that as you increase temperature, more molecules, more substrate molecules are going to have enough energy to overcome that activation barrier. So you have a faster rate of reaction as well. So that's what's happening in this part of the curve here where it's increasing like this. In fact, there's a, there's a chemistry rule that on average, for every 10 degree rise in a reaction, the rate of the reaction doubles. So you may have heard about that before. Now, if you watch here, you see that that, that holds true up to a certain point. There's a maximum rate that is found. And we're saying that the temperature that corresponds to the maximum rate for the enzyme is called the optimum temperature. Now I use a specific example here. If you're looking at human enzymes, so in other words, enzymes in our bodies, they tend to have an optimum temperature around 37 degrees Celsius. All right, so we're saying that at this temperature, the enzyme will have maximum um, velocity. The maximum, this reaction will have maximum rate. And that corresponds to the temperature for human enzymes, that is. So we say that this is the optimum temperature. Now, right after you cross 37 degrees, you see that you have a decrease in the reaction rate and it plummets quickly. It goes down. All right. Now, there's a reason for that. In fact, what's happening in this part here, the reason why the reaction rate is decreasing is because the enzyme is working, is no longer working. Now, how does an enzyme become inactive? What I kind of mentioned earlier, all right? The enzyme become inactive because the active site has lost its shape. So it means that you need to explain that part, why it is that the enzyme's active site is losing its shape. Well, the only one way is because the enzyme is being denatured. The enzyme is unfolding. Now, how does that happen? Well, remember you are increasing temperature in the system all right you're, you're adding energy in the system you're adding and this temperature is being converted to actually kinetic energy and all through the system all through this time while the temperature was increasing there was increased kinetic energy in the system and the bonds that was keeping the tertiary structure together were vibrating and what we're seeing is that when it passes the optimum temperature the the vibrations of the bonds are so strong in other words, the kinetic energy is strong enough to start to break these bonds. All right. Now, what happens is that for temperature, when you join your curve, make sure that the distance from the optimum temperature to the foot to the beginning is more than this distance here. In fact, I could have probably I should have drawn the graph coming down a little bit more. Huh? Because what we're seeing is that this denaturation it takes place quickly as soon as you cross that optimum temperature the the enzyme quickly becomes denatured and this goes down it's not a in other words it's not a symmetrical curve do not draw a symmetrical curve for me because what we are saying is that as soon as it passes the optimum temperature it just precipitates it just be, becomes denatured and the reason for that is that we say that this denaturation process is what we call a cooperative process Meaning that all this time, although there was increased kinetic energy, there was no denaturation. But as soon as you pass this point, the kinetic energy is, 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 is enough to start 
the protein to start to unfold, the enzyme to start to unfold. And what we're saying is that as soon as it starts to unfold, then it makes the rest of the enzyme easier to unfold. So you see that the enzyme just quickly unfolds and the acrocyte loses its tertiary structure immediately. So, the, so uh, as soon as you cross the, the optimum temperature, there's a lot the denaturation takes place quickly. So I hope you got all of that, right? If not, this is a very important part of enzymes. Rewind and look it over again. It's very, very important that you get this idea of how temperature affects the rate of a reaction of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. So at first it's going to increase the rate of reaction, but as soon as it passes the optimum temperature is going to denature the enzyme. The enzyme is going to lose its tertiary structure. The active site is going to lose its three-dimensional shape. And because the active site loses its three-dimensional shape, substrate cannot bind to it. So again, I, I threw out a lot of information there for you. I will tell you to stop, go back, and let's make some notes again. And I will ask you some questions along the way. So if you think you're ready to move on, let's go. So temperature, increase of velocity with temperature. The reaction velocity increases with temperature until a peak velocity is reached. And we see that the temperature that corresponds to that is called the optimum temperature. I should have probably asked you all that. So you got away from a question. I give you the answer. So let's see. This increase is the result of the increased number of molecules having sufficient energy to pass over the, the energy barrier, which will be the activation energy and form the products of the reaction and there is also an increase what do you think is there i increase what so i'm hoping you said increase collision frequency now let me ask you another question increase collision frequency between what well you should know by now it's an enzyme catalyzed reaction so it's increased collision frequency between substrate molecules and the active sites of the enzyme so you're all looking sharp people let's go ahead now, that was the increased part of the curve. Now, the curve then starts to decrease once you pass the optimum temperature. So, we say that it decrease of velocity with higher temperature. So, what you're saying is that further elevation of the temperature results in a decrease in reaction velocity, in other words, reaction rate, as a result of temperature induced. I think is the word there. What happens to the enzyme when it passes the optimum temperature? What happens? Well, I'm hoping you said that the enzyme was denatured, right? Now, if you are writing uh, an exam question about the effect of temperature on enzyme catalyzed reaction, well, then you need to explain what you mean by denaturation. Eh? Also, talk about how the, the denaturation is a cooperative process. I remember, as I said before, what a cooperative process is. Right? It means that as the protein, in this case the enzyme, as soon as it starts to unfold, once part of it starts to unfold, it makes the whole enzyme easier to unfold. So the unfolding, once it begins, which is after you pass the optimal temperature, it just unfolds quickly. So the denaturation is quick. All right. And that is why if you join the graph, the curve, it cannot be a symmetrical one. All right. The distance has to be different. And I showed you how to draw it before. So please look at it before. Right, so the optimum temperature for most human enzymes is between 35 and 40 degrees Celsius. Human enzymes start to denature as temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius. Right, and that's why you have to be careful about fevers. Eh? When body temperature starts to rise over 40 degrees, but then your enzymes are being denatured and you run the risk of some serious problems. So that's why, you know, like, like when you go to the hospital, they try to, if you have a high temperature, they, they would, like in the state, they would show you in a cold water bath and so on, right? Just so that you would reduce that temperature, because that could be very dangerous for the enzymes, all right? But here's the thing, eh? we are saying that enzymes in our body, they can go beyond 40. But um, there are thermophilic bacteria found in the hot springs that have an optimum temperature of 70 degrees. And in fact, if you go and you read, you might actually see higher values than this. So I'm going to ask you a question that I don't have the answer. I did not put the answer here. I want you all to go and find out for me. Why is it? What What about, I remember, eh, enzymes. These enzymes that we're talking about specifically are proteins. Eh? What? 
Now, it's all about, I'll give you a hint, it's, it has to do with the bonds that are responsible for the tertiary structure of the enzyme, or in other words, the protein. And what bonds may be the, the thermophilic bacteria is rich in that allows it to be to resist temperatures of over 50 degrees, while the human enzymes wouldn't be rich in those bonds, right? So go and do some reading, and I think you'll get the answer quite easily. It's an interesting thing to discuss. Right, so now we're looking at the effect of pH on an enzyme catalyzed reaction. Now, the effect of pH on the ionization of the active site, right? So we're looking at the concentration of all of hydrogen ions as well as the concentration of OH minus ions, how they affect the rate of the reaction, right? Now, I'll tell you up front that there are two things that could be happening. Now, something that we didn't go into much detail about, but I'll just point out again is that remember the active site is made of amino acids and it is the R groups that have important roles. So some of them they have a, the catalytic process usually requires that the enzyme and substrate have specific chemical groups in either an ionized or unionized state in order to interact. So like there's a type of catalysis called acid-base catalysis that involves amino groups and so on that needs to be in the protonated form and so on. All right, and the carboxyl groups as well. So the catalytic activity may require that an amino group of the enzyme be in a protonated form, like for instance, and this will be NH3 plus. All right, but at alkaline pH, this group is deprotonated, and the rate of the reaction therefore declines. So that is what what affects an enzyme, especially for small changes of pH. Right, you you have you affect the, 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 the um, ionization of these R groups, so you affect the catalytic activity, right? Now, in terms of extremes of pH, so you increase the pH drastically, it can also lead to denaturation of the enzyme because the structure of the catalytically active protein molecule depends on the ionic character of the amino acid side chains. Now, I will tell you a pause right here and go through this slide one more time because there's a lot of information there and i want to make sure that you're getting all of it and if you did let's go with this let's go back let's i'm going to pull one point of it we are saying that the effect of um ph on the amino and the carboxyl groups right how does it affect that now look all right For instance, in um, well, let's look at let's look at catalysis first of all, all right? In catalysis, we're saying that the NH3 plus groups on the amino acids and the amino acid residues on the active site has to remain as NH3 plus. But what's going to happen if I added base to this thing here? It means that if I added base. The H plus, this X, this one of the protons on the amino group is going to react with that OH minus to form what? So you're going to say it's going to form, I know you know your chemistry, NH2 plus water. So all of a sudden, this amino group is no longer in its ionized form. And that's a problem because for catalysis, we needed this amino group to be in its ionized form. Similarly, if we added H plus, it's going to affect this carboxyl group let's say for the type of catalysis that we're doing is the active site has to have a, a, a group that is in co minus but if you add h plus to that system what's going to happen the h plus is going to react with the co minus to become coh so that is in catalysis now if your ph if you change the ph enough then look at what's going to happen here it's going to affect now the tertiary structure of the protein all right now you remember that uh, one of the forces that keep the tertiary structure together, all right, one of the forces that keep the tertiary structure together is what we call um, electro static, all right. And again, I'm getting accustomed to this this um, tablet, but it's giving a little trouble. So the tertiary structure, electrostatic um, interactions. All right. Now, in electrostatic interactions, you have 
NH3 plus and you have an you have C O O minus, right? So in other words, you have these charges again being um opposite opposite charges attract. Now, if you added hydroxide ions, then this NH3 plus now become NH2, so you don't have that opposite attraction. So for strong forces of um for strong changes in pH, you're going to have that disruption here of the tertiary structure. Now, here's the thing, eh? Like for the human body, for instance, that optimum pH, in other words, the pH that the enzyme works best at, works at the, the, high, the, the optimum velocity, will vary depending on where the enzyme is in your body, for instance. So the pH at which maximum enzyme activity is achieved is different for different enzymes, all right? So for instance, like um, the digestive enzyme pepsin, which is found in the stomach. And if you, if you know your little biology, you know the stomach has HCl, the stomach is acidic. So pepsin works best at a pH around two. Now, that's good. But let's think of another digestive enzyme like trypsin. Now trypsin is made in the pancreas and it's secreted into the intestine. And that's and and trypsin likes an alkaline environment. So if you put trypsin in the stomach at pH 2, the trypsin is going to become deactivated. And vice versa, if you put pepsin in the intestine, that is going to be deactivated. Alright. So I just made up a little, well, actually, no, this, this slide I took from um, the internet, so I can't remember who I took it from. So if you all know, please let me know so I can pick up that person. All right. So this is the, the curve here for, like, let's say a hypothetical enzyme that has an optimum um, pH of 7, neutral. All right. So he has an optimum pH of 7. Now, the stomach um, enzyme pepsin he likes an um, acidic pH, all right? So that's why you see the curve here will shape this way. And then for trypsin, which likes an alkaline environment, its optimum pH is more shift to the to the right, all right? Now, the next thing I want to point out about these curves, if you if you join these curves, is that if you watch the curve here, it's symmetrical, meaning that the distance from here to the optimum pH is the same distance as the optimum pH to here. And that's so that's how it's different from temperature. Temperature, it once you start to have the nutrition, it takes place quickly, but for pH, it's a gradual thing. So you have a symmetrical curve taking place here. So it's something to remember. Now we're coming to like well, enzymes, the use of enzymes in in um in medicine and in biotechnology and so on and this is a nice read and i would tell you that if you did carbohydrates with me you have already come across this um this but it's going to trade back at you again so but this this was in reference to the united states so big up to all the people in the u.s who's listening to me now all right in the united states about 20.8 million people or 7% of the population have diabetes, all right? And you know, I think all of us know, are, are well aware of diabetes and the, the global problem that exists, all right? So basically, it is like, um, it is very important that diabetics always monitor their blood glucose levels, all right? And one very quick, uh, easy and expensive way of doing that is actually using an enzyme called glucose oxidase. So if you look here, they say here, they explain what glucose oxidase is about. Glucose oxidase is a small enzyme that converts the glucose into glucolactone, a reaction that produces hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. H2O2 is a toxic compound that can kill bacteria. This is why glucose oxidase is found on the surface of fungi but it has to protect against bacterial infections. That is a side note, all right? Um, it is also found in honey, which acts as a natural preservative, all right? This enzyme has now gone into business, becoming a center of interest of a 5 billion biotechnology industry. So people, 
I'll, I'll, I don't know if I told you all this, but enzymology, enzymologists, serious money you're talking about. It is used to fabricate biosensors that measure the amount of glucose in blood. It does this by taking something that is difficult to measure, such as well, glucose, and produce something that is easy to measure, which is hydrogen peroxide. So glucose enters the biosensor that contains the enzyme and is converted to glucolactone. In the process, hydrogen peroxide is formed, which is then measured by the detector. The more glucose there is in the blood sample, the more peroxide will be formed. That's, that's common sense. And therefore, the stronger the signal at the, at the detector. And as I said, I mentioned this when we did carbohydrates. So here it is again. So something very interesting to know. But I want you to do some extra reading for me, guys. And um, what we're seeing here is that um, we use this a lot in medicine. All right. Now, in your blood, in your plasma, you have enzymes that are what we call non-functional plasma enzymes. Uh, and these enzymes don't play a particular role in the blood. Right? They are more found in cells, in tissue, and so on. And most of the times, there's that, that basal level all right, of these non-functional plasma enzymes. And um, they, are, they are mostly there in the plasma because of the, the eruption of um, erythrocytes, which are mature red blood cells. Now, most of these enzymes are organ-specific, meaning that they are found in a particular organ. So like, let's say the liver or the heart or the kidneys or something like that. So it means that if you took blood from a patient and you saw that they had higher than normal levels, then it indicates to you that they might have some kind of organ failure, organ damage. Right? So it's a very useful and quick test to see if there's a problem. So like one of the classical examples will be um, the isozymes of LDH. Now, I don't know if you all know what LDH stands for, but it stands for lactate dehydrogenase. So there's a few things that I want you all to read up for me, all right? I want you all to tell me what, so read up what isozymes. Now, this is very, this is extra reading. It's not really on your course, but I think it's very important that we tie in what, why are we studying enzymes? What's the big deal about enzymes, right? So look and see what isozymes are, all right? And immediately... Because of our scientific minds, our scientific minds should be already clicking isomers. All right, so it, it means that isozymes has something to do with isomers. Remember, this is lactate dehydrogenase, right? And it's used to detect myocardial infractions. So it, it means that the isozymes of LDH, at least one of them, I'll give you a hint, one of them is particularly abundant or might be exclusively present in the heart. So if there's damage to the heart, muscle tissue or something, you might see more of these isozymes, certain isozymes of LDH in the blood. So this is just something for you to look at. All right, so I kind of give you a little heads up here, right? So you see, we could take the blood samples and then we could separate the different isozymes and, and, and this process is via electrophoresis, so you might want to read up about electrophoresis as well. All right, so I don't want to explain all this to you. I want you all to read it up. So what you could do is just pause this slide, give a read, but I want you to go and do some further reading about LDH and about how this can be used to see whether you have damage in your heart or in your liver and so on. These are some other enzymes as well that can be used for diagnostic purposes. And um, remember, this is just a quick idea. It's not a confirmatory test. It's, it helps with the diagnostics. All right? And I'm sure if you all are a fan of house like I am, you all heard of the, they have done um, um, tests for AST and ALT and so on. They always talk about that. All right? So... We are finally coming to the end of this lecture. I know it was long. It had a lot of information there. 
and i hope that you all will just keep going it over right because enzymes are very interesting and i hope that you all are still awake all right if if not when you get up <laughs> try again all right but in the next class we're going to be coming winding down what we are expected to do for enzymes in level one we're going to be looking at kinetics we're going to be looking at um, how these enzymes can be inhibited and we're going to be and look at the Michaelis menten curves as well as the line weaver book plots for these inhibitors all right so you have a lot more work still left but we could do that probably in one more podcast for level one enzymes that is all right so guys as usual the the biochem gm channel is growing there's a lot more podcasts there on it has things on proteins that i think will be useful for you to understand enzymes there's also enzymes one that i want you to go through as well and again if you like what you saw here show your love hit the like button subscribe to the channel so you get instant updates as well and um, just give us feedback i love hearing from you guys i i, I love I, I actually enjoy hearing that that these podcasts has changed the way you all learn biochemistry it has helped you all in your labs and so on because that's what we i'm doing these for is to, to help you all to understand biochemistry because i mean i was a student once and i've heard it from students as well how biochemistry could be very intimidating how biochemistry could be difficult so i'm hoping that i'm reaching out to you guys both in my class as well as internationally and you all are getting me help as usual, you all are more than welcome to join the Facebook page that I have created for biochemistry students. I would love to hear from you all. Um, just one thing, uh, just send a note saying, well, you, you, you got this and you got this site from um, the YouTube channel. I just don't want to just add anybody like that. Identify yourself, say why you're joining the channel. So we could only have people who are interested in learning and sharing biochemistry. Serious business people. And if you have any uh, information, worksheets, diagram, I was looking for a better diagram. So please, if you have any kind of material like that, email it to me at jasonmatthew2011 at gmail.com. And guys, it was a pleasure again teaching you all enzymes and any all, all the podcasts that I've done. I hope you all stick with biochemistry. It's a very fun and interesting subject and i am sure you're going to learn a lot from it so good luck guys with your studies and keep in touch tell me what's happening and i will talk to you all soon take care guys